Joining us now to discuss 40 years of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, here's Eric Margulies, good friend of TVO, friend of the program, and author of American Raj, Liberation or Domination. And we're always delighted when we can have you on our airwaves in the first week that we're back of any season. I'm honored, Steve. Welcome Thank back, you. great helmsman. Muammar Gaddafi, how did he come to power 40 years ago? He was a uh, mid-ranking army officer in 1969 when uh, he organized the coup against the doddering old king of Libya, uh, Idris, uh, who was a British puppet. And uh, Idris was thrown out, and with Idris went the British, and uh, in came the Americans. And it is said that behind the coup was the CIA, which handpicked Gaddafi in another of its triumphant successes, <laughs> and Gaddafi took over. That's 1969, and he's still in power today. He is indeed. Now, you've met him. Yes. What do you recall of that meeting? Well, I recall uh, two things vividly. One, sitting in his tent uh, outside the Bab al-Azizia barracks, where he was his headquarters, just the two of us in his tent, and uh, him talking to me. Uh, late into the night. When was this? This was 1987. It was a year after the U.S. tried to kill him by bombing his headquarters. The other event was he took me by the hand, so I can really say I've held hands with Gaddafi, and I've also been kissed by King Farouk, but that's another program <laughs> coming up. Uh, he led me by the hand through the ruins of his residence in the barracks that had been bombed by the Americans, where his two-year-old adopted daughter had been killed. And he said to me, still holding hands, Mr. Eric, why are the Americans trying to kill me? Now, his personality has been much discussed over the years, and people have thought he's either crazy like a fox or just crazy. What did you pick up when you were with him? Well, he's, he's very eccentric. He's odd. It's almost as if he sits in his chair, he looks up, and it's as if he's hearing voices from above or somewhere out in the desert. And he's really he's a desert Bedouin. They do hear things that we don't hear. But uh, he's odd, he's very eccentric. He, at times he looks like a clown, ridiculously flamboyant. But, you know, say what you want about Gaddafi. Uh, he has survived longer than anybody else in the Middle East when everybody was trying to kill him. His neighbors, his Arab brothers, the Israelis, the French, the English, and of course the Americans. Well, this is what I want to pick up on. How's he done it? How's he managed to stay in power for 40 years? You, well, he moves his tents around a lot. In <laughs> fact, the night that the Americans bombed his, bar his, his residence, he was sitting out in his tent in the backyard thinking. And uh, he's been very nimble, and he's played off uh, different groups against the other. And the West has never been able to decide whether Gaddafi was a bigger villain or, or, or more useful. <laughs> so he keeps shuffling on, and he has very, very fierce security services who, what, uh, crush his enemies at the... The Mugabarat, yes, who yeah. crush any signs of resistance, and there are informers everywhere. And uh, he has uh, been ruthless in, uh, not bloody, but uh, still fairly ruthless. Hmm. Uh, here's something from the Sunday Telegraph from earlier this year that talks a bit about his relationship with the rest of the world. Welcome to Libya 2009, where Colonel Gaddafi is reinventing himself again. Having variously donned the roles of revolutionary leader, state sponsor of terrorism, and savior of Africa over the years, the man once labeled Mad Dog by Ronald Reagan is now eager to don a new guise, friend and ally of Barack Obama. The U.S. president's half Kenyan ancestry marks him out, in the colonel's view, as a fellow African leader. Do you imagine, you've told us that the Americans over the years have tried to kill him, do you imagine Libyan-American relations will improve now that Obama's president? Uh, yes, but not because Obama's Obama or from Kenya or anything else like that. Uh, Gaddafi got fed up with his brother, the Arabs. Uh, he said they were all a bunch of losers and uh, he wanted to have nothing to do with them. He said they're all a bunch of, of quizlings and uh, to toadies to the U.S. and the Western powers. And he's turned his sights on uniting Africa. Uh, failing to unite the Arabs, which is already an impossible task, he has to unite Africa. But he has about 57 or $58 billion a year of oil income from Libya's high-grade oil, and he's dishing it out in Africa. So the Africans have to humor him, and he's now president of the African Union, and everybody kisses his feet when he comes in because he dishes out so much money. But is it because he's so fed up with his Arab brethren that he has decided to throw his lot in with the West, because clearly he's, he's made great overtures in the past, uh, I don't know, year or two, to be on friendlier terms with Western governments. He, uh, first of all, he got tired of people trying to kill him uh, from the, the Western powers. 
the, the last, the latest ones who did it were the British. They tried to kill him with a car bomb in Benghazi. And uh, he, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, he had nobody to play off after the US invasion of Iraq. He was afraid that they might invade Libya. And uh, so he did a number of these things, but he realized that the West simply bid highest because they had bid for all these oil deals, arms deals, nuclear reactors, export commodities. I mean, Libya is a Klondike for Western exporters. And you see all the Western leaders, like the British Prime Minister Brown and President Sarkozy of France uh, holding hands with Muammar, the, the mad dog of the Mideast, and, and kissing up with him and making themselves look ridiculous as he's standing there in his opera booth uniforms uh, with his medals and everything else. And they're standing there because they're trying to sell arms. But can you tell whether they have had any kind of volt fuss in their own parliaments or governments? insofar as they actually take this guy on the level now? Oh, no, not at all. He's, he's still horrible, Muammar, but everybody's, but he's, he's got too much money to be angry at anymore. And uh, he's, everybody's holding their noses and trying to do business with him. Let's talk terrorism. This was from the Wall Street Journal uh, just a couple of days ago by Bernard-Henri Lévy. The truth is that the Libyan regime has never denied its guilt in the Lockerbie bombing. You talked about it a moment ago, Eric. On the contrary, in 2003, it committed to contributing $10 million to compensate each one of the families of the 270 victims. So, convicted bomber Abel Basset Ali Megrahi was repatriated to a country where a man is treated like a hero, not because he is believed to be innocent, but because he is known to be guilty of murdering people whose only crime was happening to be citizens of democratic countries. If he wants some kind of rapprochement with the West, why did he do what he just did in welcoming this terrorist home as a hero? Because he's got a do domestic political constituency. And al Magrahi was regarded as a national hero in Libya, a man who was sacrificed to save Libya from a, a punishing a dis totally destructive uh, trade embargo. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Libyans, by the way, Levy is wrong. The Libyans have never admitted that they were guilty of the Pan Am bombing, but they accepted uh, they, they agreed to pay reparations, millions of dollars of reparations. Well, why would you do that if you weren't responsible? To avoid the trade embargo oh, okay. by the United States and its allies. And Megrahi was thrown to the wolves as a sacrificial offering. Yeah. I've studied the case uh, for a long time. I believe that Megrahi was framed. The Scottish authorities were going to really open up a whole can of worms in this case. And that's one of the reasons he was sent back, because the British authorities didn't want an appeal to happen that would have brought out the collusion of the British governments and trying to frame this case. But look, uh, Libya uh, still denies it was innocent. However, comma, Libya did ag admit to downing a French UTA airliner over Chad in uh, 1989, I think it was, or 88 and killing all these people on board. They said it was a rogue officer. I had dinner with him. He was the head of Libyan intelligence, al Sanusi. Uh, but uh, don't forget that the United States shot down, five months before the Pan Am airliner was shot down, the US cruiser Vincennes in the Gulf, inside Iranian waters, shot down an Iranian civilian airliner, inside Iranian airspace, killed almost 300 people, and the captain of the ship was given a medal and, and Vice President George Bush Sr. at the time said, I'll never apologize. Although they did acknowledge culpability, admitted responsibility, and did pay compensation if memory yes, serves. Yes, less than the Libyans had to pay out. Okay. Let's talk about Gaddafi and the neighbors. You referenced his relations with other Arab countries uh, a moment ago. Let's play some tape from the Arab Summit, and then we'll come back and talk. Roll tape, please, Michael. <laughs> كلنا نكره بعضنا ونتخاصم مع بعضنا ونكيد لبعضنا ونشمت في بعضنا ونتآمر على بعضنا احنا مخابراتنا التآمر على بعضنا ما ما تحمي فينا من العدو احنا عدو لبعضنا وعدو العربي صديق للعربي الاخر I remember watching that speech when he first gave it and just being dumbfounded that he would give such a tongue lashing to his uh, fellow Arab leaders what do they think of him now Oh, they hate him. They're, they're just embarrassed to death by Gaddafi, but he's too rich to avoid again. He, for, since 1969, he's been calling the Arab oil monarchs American stooges, and he'd say they're giving away Arab oil for nothing. 
because they're a, they're a bunch of toadies to the West, and they hate that. And then he demanded that they raise oil prices, and he shamed the Arabs into raising oil prices uh, in 1979, and that really put uh, Gaddafi on the U.S. blacklist. Uh, and he's gone on and on like that. I mean, he's, he's got a motor mouth, and, but he's quite right in what he says about the Arabs. That's the unfortunate part. Uh, right in so far as? Uh, that they uh, stab each other in the back. All they do is conspire. They're, they, they're their own worst enemies. And they're... And uh, help the Palestinian uh, people. Hope they've yeah. screwed the Palestinian people. Uh, and they're a bunch of incompetence and children, as he calls them. He's currently the chairman of the African Union, and he is, as you suggested earlier, advancing this new position of trying to create a United States of Africa. Does that have legs? No. Not at really? all. In the United States of Libyan oil money, uh, it'll last as long as the coffers are, or the, the money's flowing from Tripoli. But after that, there, there, there's no concept of African unity. There's not even unity in most African countries, never mind a continental unity. But he's there, and he's been there for four decades. Is it within any kind of realm of possibility that other African countries would look to him and say, well, this is a strong man who knows how to stay in power. Maybe he can get something done. I don't think so. He's looked at as a figure of amusement and uh, scorn and sort of fascination in these countries, but not as a role model. Hmm. He's the longest serving Arab leader alive today, I believe, 40 years. How strong is his hold on power today? It's pretty strong, mm -hmm. uh, amazingly enough. And now it's stronger, ironically, because the, West, the Western powers have stopped trying to kill him because suddenly the West is pouring money and investment into Libya. They want Libyan oil. Uh, it's a gold mine for the Western powers. So now what they will do is the same thing they've done in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. They're going to send in the Western intelligence services to protect Gaddafi <laughs> because he's now become a useful servant. He's also useful against militant Islamist groups because uh, he's been fighting them for years because they've singled him out as they did Saddam Hussein as the, the archetype of a terrible Arab despot who has to be removed. So he's now become a, a useful ally of the West. He's not 70 years old yet, despite the fact that he's been there for 40 years. Well, and you know, I'm looking at him and I'm, I'm convinced that he's had a number of facelifts uh, since I sat with him. And I think it's done by Johnny Holiday, the, the French rock star who I really like. I think he's done by the same as Johnny's, the same facelift. It looks familiar. Are you being serious? You think yes, he, I am. You, you, think, you think he's had work done? Oh, yeah, for sure. Really? Where do you get a facelift in Tripoli, I wonder? Get it in either Rome. He probably oh, goes leave. to Berlusconi's. <laughs> or either Berlusconi's doctor who does Berlusconi's face, or he does it in Paris. I see. Okay. Who do you think his likely successor is? He, he's still, a, you know, for a guy who's been there 40 years, he's a relatively young man, but he will be succeeded someday. What it's do you think? It's hard to say in Libya because uh, they're all pygmies beside Gaddafi. The, the little acorns aren't growing in the, in the shade of this big tree. He's grooming his uh, second oldest son, I think it is Saif ul Islam, sword of Islam, uh, to uh, take over from him. And I think the West will try and facilitate Saif because they know him. He's, he's not a wild man. Not like uh, Saddam Hussein's they can kids. Work, uh, that's right, exactly. Like Uday and, uh, and Kusai. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I would say he's probably the best bet. Could you imagine Libya being governed dramatically differently under the sun? No. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no Libya in Libya. It's really, it used to be just a gas stop on the way from Alexandria to Tunis. And uh, it's only five million people, maybe less. They can't really count how many there are. And there's no national identity of any kind. Uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a nebulous country. So it's, it, it's hard speaking of it as a country. It certainly has no institutions that would take over. Hmm. Eric, as always, great to see you here, and thanks for coming in to talk to us about 40 years of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. My pleasure, Steve.